Welcome back, warrior friends. Mrs. Armstrong with you. Um, today we are ready for chapter number eight in Night of the Twisters. But before I read, I want to share one picture with you. First of all, let me give credit to the local newspaper, Grand Island Daily Independent, for sharing this picture and allowing me to share it with you guys. Um, I chose this picture because at the end of chapter seven, Dan, Arthur, Stacy, and Dan's mom had made it down to the corner of their block where search and rescue teams were beginning to search each house in the neighborhood to make sure that everybody had safely gotten out. As they searched a house or a car and they knew that everybody was out, they would spray paint a red X on the car or on the house. That way, if any other rescue teams had come up later, they didn't waste any time searching a car or a house that had already been searched and cleared. Do you see the red X? In this picture. All right, let's go ahead and start chapter number eight. Before we begin, let me uh, once again thank our publishing company, HarperCollins Publisher, and the author, Ivy Rockman, for giving us permission to do read alouds. Our chapter is titled, Later On. I guess mom expected some other volunteers to rush off to Miss Smiley's with us, but that wasn't how it worked out. The civilians, as the civil defense men called them, were needed elsewhere, and we didn't wait to find out where. We took off running. When we got to Smiley's place, what we saw was really incredible. Her big old cottonwoods were still in leaf, and beyond the trees, trees, her white frame house loomed in front of us, same as always, only now it was topless. Amazingly, the four walls were still standing four square, and the front porch jutted out like the chin of a stubborn old-timer who simply refused to budge. Quickly, we were up on the porch, moving aside the limbs and the trash that had blown onto it, all of us exclaiming over how, Bel how lucky Belle Schmiley was. She was right about her old storm door, Arthur said as we walked in. Only a couple of dents. We didn't waste any time getting to the kitchen where the basement stairs were, and sure enough, the steps had collapsed under the weight of the back porch, part of which seemed to have slid in sideways, landing in a mound of rubble down below. Mrs. Smiley? We called first, taking turns and listening. Smiley, can you hear us? Our only answer had been the moaning of the wind as it tore through the broken windows in the rattled house. If she was down there, she didn't hear us or she couldn't answer one or the other. Our next problem was getting down below to find her. After dismissing a few harebrained ideas of mine, Arthur came up with a plan. Stacy thought it sounded too dangerous, but we talked her into trying it by saying we would go first. Arthur had read about a rescue operation in the Antarctic where an Eskimo had used an upended sled. I couldn't quite picture what he had in mind, but Stacy and I went to work doing what he told us to. Grunting and cussing as needed, the three of us lowered Mrs. Smiley's heavy kitchen table, legs up, through the stair opening until it came to rest on something solid. I was the first one to drop onto it, with Stacy training the light on me from up above. I crept down the slippery slide slope of the table until I could grab a support post. It was easy to swing from there down to the basement floor. Arthur made the same trip, but under his weight, however, the table slipped and the whole thing came crashing onto the cement, barely missing me. He wasn't hurt, but that ended it for Stacy. With all the noise we were making and still no response from Mrs. Smiley, I decided she was either dead of a heart attack or had turned her hearing aid down to zero. Then Stacy lowered her light to us by tying it to the strings of a smelly old mop that she found someplace. My flashlight had grown so faint that we left it upstairs. Slowly at first, Arthur shone the light all around us. There wasn't any sign of Smiley. He lighted up her old-fashioned furnace, which was spooky as anything down here in the dark, with its arms outreaching in direct all directions. Arthur and I sniffed around, but all we could smell was a musty basement. He next shone the light across Smiley's gleaming rows of canned fruit and tomatoes onto pieces of old furniture that she had stored everywhere. There wasn't a whole lot of room for walking, but we started out. Mrs. Smiley, I bellowed several times. 
Arthur shot the light around and behind everything along the narrow little passageways that we came to. It gave me the creeps, thinking that we could stumble over her body without seeing it. I couldn't decide what would be worse, stumbling over it or seeing it. I guess Arthur was thinking along the same lines. Wouldn't this make a terrific spooky alley? He whispered. A few seconds later, I heard a really weird sound. Arthur put on his brakes so fast that I bumped into him. Did you hear that? He said. I nodded. We stood there listening as it repeated itself twice more. Did you find her? Stacy called from up above, making us both jump. Shh, we said together. Arthur pointed with the light. It's coming from over there, I think. Will somebody answer me? Stacy yelled louder. In a minute, Arthur boomed right into my ear. I followed him around an old dresser and passed a spidery wooden high chair, then down an aisle of storage boxes. The white beam bounced ahead of us in the direction of the noise. I caught my breath when I saw her. There she was, curled up on an old sofa with only her mouse nest hair sticking out above the blanket. She wasn't dead. She was asleep and snoring for all she was worth. Arthur grinned at me and we started laughing. We couldn't help it. How could anybody sleep through a tornado? She made another little series of snorts, dainty this time as if she knew we were listening. Arthur went double and grabbed his sides. We couldn't stop howling, either of us. Overhead, the sound of the wind battering the house. Stacy could hear us whooping it up, and she thought we had flipped. What is going on? She kept yelling, but we were too weak to answer. A little later, it was almost as funny trying to get Mrs. Smiley out of the bloomin' cellar, as she put it. She was being an awfully good sport but said that she was no mountain goat and to remember that. We couldn't get, it, get, we couldn't get her to try the little stair-step system that Arthur had rigged up underneath a window with a chair and a stool, though he demonstrated it could be done with a little pull-up at the end. Pull-up, Mrs. Smiley snorted. I'm 81 years old, boys. Don't you think I'm better off just staying down here? It's too dangerous, Arthur tried to explain. The police said everybody should get out because there could be explosions and fires. Land sakes, she muttered. Never thought I'd be chased off by a darned old cyclone. She kept running her hands in and out of her sweater pockets. I could tell she was pretty nervous. Stacy was outside the window by that time, removing the broken glass from the sill with the same mop, giving us weather reports. You guys think of something, she said. The rain let up for a minute. It'll be a lot easier if we can get Mrs. Smiley down to the bus before it starts again. Suddenly, Smiley brightened up. How about if we call the fire department? They'd come out for an old scaredy cat like me. The flash, I flashed the light at Arthur, who was rolling his eyes. We couldn't get it through to her head how bad things were. If we fool around long enough, he said down low, the fire department will be here. Finally, though, I had an idea. We dragged the sofa that she had been sleeping on to the window, and we tried angling a set of old-timey bed springs from the cushions to the wall. Arthur and I took turns testing it, changing the angle of the springs and trying it again. It sagged a little bit underneath Arthur's weight, but it made a pretty fair ladder for somebody my size. Smiley watched, shining the light on us as we worked, predicting everything from broken bones to heart failure if she tried to climb that monkey fence herself. By the time we were ready to boost her up there, Stacy had a blanket folded, out, folded up on the windowsill. We'll get you out, she kept encouraging Smiley. I'm really strong, huh, Arthur? We can't just leave you here, you know. Anything could happen. Then, as if she'd just thought of it, Hey, 
I could try it first. I will if you want me to. For a second, I forgot all about Smiley. Stacy looked so beautiful hanging over that windowsill, her hair whipping across her red and swollen cheek. I was beginning to think of her as a rescuing angel or something. Take her other arm, Dan, Stacy said in a sharp voice that brought me back to earth. It took a little more coaxing, but we finally got Smiley up on the sofa, gasp, grasping the coils in both hands and looking scared. Spider-Man, Arthur whispered before I punched him. Thank goodness for Stacy, who was hanging halfway in now and saying all the right things. I don't think that Smiley would have tried it for Arthur and me alone. The two of us stood on the sofa below, Arthur on one side, me on the other, boosting her from behind as she started up. The situation suddenly struck Smiley as being funny. I am not going to believe I did this she said in a giggly voice as she reached for another handhold. When I wake up, I just know I'll never have done this. And then push, she sang out, and we pushed. We also had to take turns getting her shoes into the next spring coil up. On she went six inches at a time. Here comes Sir, Sir Edmund Hillary, she announced better than halfway, and Arthur and I cracked up. Keep coming, you're almost here, cooed Stacy at the top. Once there, Smiley paused, teetering dangerously as she tried to see out the window past Stacy. Oh Lord, I hope the whole neighborhood isn't out here to see me kill myself. I'm the only one here, Stacy said, and you're doing great. Stacy had a good grip on Smiley's shoulders now. One more step ought to do it, Mrs. Smiley. Can you take one more step? It took all three of us using the push-pull method to get her through the little rectangular window. Tiny as she is, she claimed to have dropped 10 pounds during the process. But the only thing she seemed to lose that we could see was a button off of her old gardening sweater. And my dignity, she was to say later, improving the story every time she told it. After getting her out, Arthur and I easily scrambled up the coils and out the window. We had so much practice. By then, Stacy was shining the flashlight all around and under the trees so Smiley could see how our neighborhood had been devastated. The house that once stood a hefty stone's throw from Smiley's simply didn't exist anymore. Oh my, she said in a trembly voice. Oh my, oh my, I thought I was the only one. Her skirt flapped noisily against her skinny bowed legs. Nobody was laughing now. I'm going to pause right there. Um, I'm limited on how long I can make our movies um, due to the technology that I'm using. So I will pause there and we'll pick up the rest of this chapter in the next video. Thanks for joining me. See you soon.